Hey guys, um, clearly I've been avoiding filming in part because I look like a gremlin every day now. It's, um, it's exactly what I want. It's blissful, but there are plenty of videos I've, I've wanted to make. I just couldn't get back on camera without talking about COVID first. Um, and unlike in a typical conversation, there's a, there's a certain spiraling effect of, um, you know, following the course of my own thoughts without anyone to redirect or stop them. So I am going to acknowledge a few things here, but I can understand if some of you aren't up for that. And if that's the case, I'm going to leave a timestamp below to when I talk about books. I guess to start, I should say that I'm not in New York. I came to my parents' house in Pennsylvania before New York had a shelter-in-place order. And I packed for a two-week stay. I had been following the news closely up until that point, and I, I think that's just one more indication of how in the dark we all were about, um, about our impending reality. I miss my neighborhood. Um, it's weird not to be there. Uh, a lot of people who are close to me still are. Everyone from my, my sister to, um, the people who work in, in the tiny supermarket below my apartment. I would go there every day because I'm not a great cook. I live a TV dinner heavy lifestyle. So actually I saw those people a lot more than my sister. To see people in power respond to this moment with ignorance indifference, malice. There's, there's a physical toll to absorbing these kind of constant batterings to common sense, to compassion, to science. To be informed is to feel unhinged. There is no door number two. And I don't want to sound overly cynical about America because we're hyper aware now of small daily heroism and kindness and that's nothing to discount but the extent of this country's pathological individualism is on display and it's ugly. There's a funny phenomenon too of people sharing their personal pain and stress while telegraphing how ashamed they are to need to share it. And I think perspective is more valuable than ever, but it, as long as you're aware of the relative scale of your problems, I don't think shame should so readily enter into that conversation. And in fact, that's that's how we're, we're programmed. You know, the the magnitude of this disaster, you can know it and you can maybe understand it to a certain extent but you can't process it we're we're not wired for that we're wired to process our personal circumstances um and throughout this i found myself thinking thank god <laughs> like, like let's use perspective to make systemic change that needs to be made but Thank God for the provincialism of my brain right now. It is a defense mechanism. I appreciate you. So I'm going to talk about some of my personal circumstances. Fair warning to those of you who don't care. I respect that. Um, I'm thankful that this is a community of people who know me pretty well and hopefully will give me the benefit of the doubt that I, I recognize the negligible nature of my problems in the grand scheme of what we're all experiencing. I mean... I'm one of 29% of Americans who can fully work from home, which that, that was a staggering statistic the first time I saw it. And it's one thing to know you're lucky and it's another thing to know numerically how lucky you are. But um, okay, all of that was me deferring, complaining, but I will be deferred no longer. So right as the world fell to shit, I started a new position in my company still in the foreign rights department, but where before I was the secondary foreign agent to all of our clients in the smaller co and territories for the most part. Now, for certain clients, I'm the primary agent 
in the larger direct territories, which means I've been familiarizing myself with all of their projects and introducing myself ad nauseum to foreign editors. And part of me is thrilled by this change to have more responsibility and projects I'm working on are so cool and so up my alley, but it's also a strange time to be trying to sell books to foreign countries, you know, countries that are experiencing economic crises that are gradually gutting their book industries. Understandably, foreign houses are incredibly cautious about what they're acquiring at the moment, and in practice that makes it tough to place certain kinds of books in this climate, especially debuts I'm finding, and also books that would have ordinarily been better fits for more indie or, or niche houses. Um, it's been challenging to feel such a responsibility to my clients when everything seems like an uphill battle and to have a certain thirst to prove myself with no way to know how to do that, you know, because all the typical signifiers of dedication and thoughtfulness are gone. You know, the correlation between hard work and results is just broke down. Some work days it's like, let's send this book into the void. And now let's strategize about which voids to send this book into. And I'm barely refraining from working all weekend because if I'm killing myself, then surely I must be accomplishing something. So yeah, that's, that's where I am. This is your cue that you can stop playing the, the world's tiniest violin now. Thing is, once you've unlocked a certain level of nerddom, there is pretty much no situation you can't use to then discuss how it's affecting your reading. So let's do this. I totally get people's brains being too fried and numb and traumatized to focus while reading at the moment. No pressure involved with that. It'll be there for you when you're ready to make it part of your life again. But because I have had to blitz read for work over the past few weeks, I haven't had an option of, of letting that part of my brain go dormant, which has been nice in a way. I haven't had any kind of a reading slump so far and reading has continued to play all of its its normal roles for me. My reading choices haven't been affected that much either. I, I'm not necessarily craving comforting books or happy books. Actually, I, I recently read Bloodlands by Timothy Snyder, which is the most calamitous book I've ever read, and it's exacting and dismal as all hell, but it was the perfect book for me the week that I read it because it's completely absorbing. And whenever I sat down with it, I had to block out everything else in order to, to digest all the information it was giving me. And I found that that was a sort of back roots way of, of calming and centering my brain. My TBR goals have been going really well, surprisingly well. That's going to be the subject of my next video. I think I'll make a separate video too on the three books that I've bought so far this year because I've read them. Bloodlands was the third. So I guess what's left to talk about here um, is my, my recent and current reads. So I finished Portrait of a Lady by Henry James. It is probably my favorite book up to this point in the year. I, I was afraid that Henry James would be another E.M. Forster or Thomas Hardy, you know, someone whose books seem tailor-made for my taste, but whose sentence level style, especially Hardy's, you know, wouldn't click with me. But even though James is famous for his, his detailed winding sentences, there's of rhythm and stress that mirror the rhythm and stress I would naturally impose on those sentences. Reading this was like 
breathing. It's your classic slow burn. Every seemingly random piece of information has a kind of payoff down the road. Partway through the book, this slight ominous note rings out and it's, it's clear as can be and yet James gives you just enough room to question yourself and hope against hope that things will continue to be fine. Um, it's it's a theater of emotions type book, and there are microscopic character studies in here such that it's like you know these people, but it would be difficult to describe any of them because any adjective you'd use to do that, you would immediately feel compelled to, to qualify it. From my winter TBR, I also read Wolf Nation by Brenda Peterson and plan to talk about it in another video eventually because it was just super eye-opening, really smart introduction to the topics of American hunting of wolves and eventual preservation, sliding back and forth between the two a lot. And then I'm currently reading The Story That Cannot Be Told by J. Casper Kramer. This is a middle grade novel set in communist Romania and I love it. I accept that most middle grade won't be for me because it isn't written for me, you know, hello, but that makes it all the more special when you find a book that that works on those multiple levels. I, I feel like my 11 year old self would have loved this in a different way from how my 27-year-old my self is loving it. If I hadn't been gifted this by a friend whose taste I trust, I would have been wary of the folklore and storytelling elements going in, um, partly because I don't think the author's background is Romanian, so there could have easily been an, an exoticizing angle to all of that. And then also books about the power of storytelling can easily be a bit precious, you know, a bit um, on the nose. But um, no, this one is, is lovely and it's part of a slew of Central and Eastern European related books that I've been reading in 2020. Speaking of which, my final update is that I'm reading The Witcher books, you guys. I watched the Netflix series because I was bored and Henry Cavill's face is like architecture. I could not care less about his strange vocal choices or um, wooden acting. Plus you can tell that he's a dork for this whole world and uh, reportedly he like begged to play this part. So really he's one of us and um, just happens to have biceps the size of tree trunks. But the first season of the series was just good enough that I was intrigued and just bad enough that I suspected the source material might actually be good. And it is. I've read um, the two prequel short story collections so far, The Last Wish and Sword of Destiny. And I'm currently at the beginning of the first novel, Blood of Elves, um, and having a grand old time. There's just, you know, it's, it's involving. <laughs> and that's, like I said, what I want right now. There are cool characters, political intrigue, action but not too much, in-world sexism but not bad enough to be a deal breaker, you know, it's that kind of fantasy and whenever I'm not in the mood to pick up something else that I'm in the middle of, like I turn to these books on my Kindle and I've <laughs> really, really been enjoying it. That's plenty. Those of you who wanted to check in are probably sorry that you manifested this ramble-a-thon, but you can tell me how you are below if you want to talk about that or if you'd rather, you know, I always love to hear reading updates from your end. Take care. I'm, I'm hoping that you're all safe and I'll see you soon for another video. And as a final calming thing, here's a sleeping Gus Gus. I hope you all have things in your life that are making you smile right now and feel some kind of calm, if only briefly. All right, bye guys, take care.